I didn't memorize the lines. And I, in the back of my head, I knew I wasn't going in there. I'd already signed in. I sat down. I saw a bunch of people there. I'm sure there were like five or six people in front of me. So there was a good chunk of time where I sat there and I, I thought, you know what? What if I just left? What if I just left? So I left. Welcome to my worst audition. Welcome back to My Worst Audition. With me today is my friend and very talented actor, writer, director, comedian, multi-hyphenate enthusiast, Greg Burke, who performs sketch and improv comedy at the UCB Theater in New York City and L.A. Greg has created and produced scripted streaming series for Broadway Video, Nerdist, Fox Digital, Catalyst Entertainment, Funny or Die, and Crack.com. And perhaps most impressively, the videos made by his sketch comedy group, Greg and Lou, have garnered over 50 million views online. Most recently, Greg appeared on TV in the CW's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and on True TV's Adam Ruins Everything. But most relevant to me, he appears in my world, directing many recent comedy sketches in which I was privileged to perform. Greg Burke, thank you so much for joining me. Gary, that was so well done. I love that. You improvised a few lines in there. You had a little Dr. Evil 50 million impression. That was great. Did I get Thank the part? Thank you, Gary. You got the part. Uh, and you were also uh, the most important thing in my world when I direct you. So Thank you. Well, I mean, I'm an actor and only child, so I'm the most important thing in everyone's world as far as I'm concerned. I did not know you were an only child. We're going to get into that. Yeah, which makes sense. Now, by the way, for anybody watching, you see this lovely uh, painting behind Greg. He insisted that he have this behind him for That's the right. entire interview. I said, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. He's like, no, it has to be there. Um, it's metaphorical. I don't even know why, but there it is. I just love cowboys herding cows. So that's why I wanted to make sure it was in there. It also happens to be conveniently close to the Wi-Fi in his dad's office where he is currently recording from while he's on the East Coast. Oh, right. That's why I'm here. It's probably yes. the reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But thank you for rolling with that. Sure. <laughs> sure, Gary. No problem. He, he does the improvisations, kids. He's really yes, good. Yes, and. Yes, and. So we just, we got together less than a week ago. We did another shoot with, uh, mm-hmm. with Lou. I had a great time as always. Thank you so much for including me. Of course. And I forced you to do about an hour and a half in the freezing cold in a uh, wide open field in New Jersey with uh, a lot of sickness running around the set. So I appreciate you doing that. It was fine. It was my pleasure, man. Anytime, I, it's not like my favorite thing to be in the cold, but in all seriousness, anytime something like that happens, I'm like, oh, I'm so cold. I think to myself, you know, I had an old life where I was just working a regular nine to five job, sitting behind a desk in a suit, watching the sun go up and go down out the window, feeling like the world was passing me by. And I got paid to play like a child. So, yeah, it was a little cold, but at the end of the day, it was fun. So, f- it. I had a great time. Thanks, man. We did have fun, but no, seriously, you gave a really great performance. So, I appreciate that. I, and you directed me very well. I appreciate that. We're, wow. just, we're just metaphorically sucking our dicks the whole time in this interview. This is great. Does, does your podcast have a lot of moments of levity? Well, like maybe one or two every other podcast, I think. Okay. I don't know. Meh. No. What if I sabotage my entire appearance on your podcast just saying you need to change your podcast? Is Do that it. a terrible podcast appearance? No, that'd make for a very okay. interesting podcast. This entire podcast is about me and guests sabotaging auditions, so why not okay. sabotage the podcast? That's true. All right. Get this back on track. Go ahead. Gather yourself. How do we segue into the next part? I, I have no segue. I'm not smooth like that, but this is my worst audition, and I mean, you know, you've been in comedy your whole life. You've been acting your whole life. I, you, you were originally on a soap opera, and... I would have prepared, but I don't even remember the name of the soap opera. Which one was it? Oh, it was Guiding Light, Gary. Guiding Light. The longest running soap opera in television history. I didn't know that. It was. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're on Guiding Light. You played a a child on Guiding Guiding Light. And Shelly, our mutual friend Shelly, who performed with us the other day and who has been on this podcast before, showed me your Reese's Peanut Butter Cup ad from when you were a kid. I was blown away because I grew up watching that ad. I remember that ad even as she described it to me. So I shot that commercial when I was six years old, and it ran for 10 years. Wow! It ran uh, from 1987 to 1997. Into 1997? Or or 88 into 98. It was something like that, yeah. Was it a union spot? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was a huge spot. It's... it's, uh, They don't do commercials like that anymore, as I'm sure you know. But, like, they don't run commercials that long anymore. 
you you just must be sitting on hundreds of dollars. No, they paid me in Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> so I I really shouldn't have signed that contract, but they that's are the good. Deal I got. They are delicious. Yeah. All right, so you you've been around the block for a while. I mean, you've been doing this in this business far longer than I have. I started at the age of twenty nine, so. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. I assume you must have some stories. Uh, sure, I do. Well, so the story I have is also when I was a kid. Um, and it's, uh, it's a painful story. And um, I'm not kidding when I say this. I have never told the story to anyone before. I'm not kidding. Uh, and, and I'm doing this, Gary, because I, I, I do enjoy uh, your friendship and your performances. And... Uh, I, I, I can't think of any other better place to share this story than on your podcast. Oh, I, I am in, I'm sincerely honored in all seriousness. Okay. So uh, let me set this up. Uh, I was a child actor. I started acting when I was five years old. And uh, from five years old you know, to college, I was on a ton of commercials and I did uh, Law and Order and all the local you know, New York spots, guest guest starring roles. Um, and, uh, I was on guiding light for five years and I essentially auditioned after school every day for about 10 years of my life wow. from like six to 16. Um, I auditioned almost every day into the city wow. and the way I would get into the city is that my mom would drive me into the city from Staten Island, which is where I'm from to Manhattan for auditions. It's a bit of a drive. It's a long drive. And um, it's, uh, I hope my mom never sees this because she is the, the real victim of all of this. And I feel terrible. And I've, I've thought about this. I thought about this audition all my life because it, it makes me feel like And I'm sorry you have to bleep that out. And it puts a knot in my stomach every time I think about it. So... Um, I used to go on auditions for, for big roles. I was really close to getting the role in Jumanji as the kid in Jumanji. No way. I was really close to getting, I had a third callback for The Good Son that ended up starring Elijah Wood with Macaulay Culkin. And Elijah, Elijah Wood is my arch nemesis, even though he doesn't realize it. So I had a third callback for The Good Son and Elijah Wood was in the room. Uh, and he got the role. And then a year later, I had a callback for North. And I didn't get that. And Elijah Wood got that. Um, so this wasn't an Elijah Wood thing. But it was uh, it's, it's sort of the background for what sets this up. So I was, uh, I was 13 years old. And I was going on all these auditions. I had a, I had a big casting. Uh, I had a big uh, agent. Innovative Artist was my agent. Which they're big now. They were even bigger back then. Okay. And uh, I used to go out on um, uh, auditions for, for big roles in movies and TV shows. And uh, I would get really close on some of them and I wouldn't get them. Some I would get. But I was on a string before this happened. I was on a string of, of coming close to getting stuff and not getting it. Hmm. And it was, uh, it was starting to get to me. And I was 13 and I didn't know how to process those feelings. So, uh, this audition comes around, and I'm sorry, I cannot remember what the movie was, but I was going on audition for the son of the main character, like the main guy in the movie. And, um, and my mom told me I had the audition, and she, she gave me the script. Back then, we used to have to print out the script through fax, like my agent would fax the script to me, and that's how I would, I would see the, the, the dialogue, the, uh, the scenes. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like a 10 page script. And I, to myself, I said, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to get it. This is pointless. Mm. I'm never going to get this. Cause I, I had, I had gotten close on a bunch of stuff like the months before that. And it didn't happen. I, I didn't process it well. And I just said to myself, I'm not going to get this. What's the point? Mm. What's the point in doing this? So I didn't want to memorize the script. I'm sure I had baseball going on or some kind of bull that I shouldn't have been paying attention to having this opportunity in front of me but i was like screw this i don't want to do it mm -hmm. so i didn't memorize the lines and uh i didn't tell my mom that i didn't want to do it i just i didn't want to i didn't want to disappoint my mom i didn't want to tell my mom no so day comes around and uh my mom picks me up from school and drives me into the city 
and it's an hour plus drive from Staten Island to the city. And we get to the audition. And, and so what my mom would have to do is she'd have to park the car in the streets of Manhattan and illegally park, right? While I go up by myself, I go up to the audition. And then every once in a while, like a meter maid would come around and like wave my mom and she'd have to drive around the block, mm-hmm. right? And get find a new spot and do the whole thing over and again. And uh, so as I go up, I'm sure my mom had to do this like four or five times. So I go up to the audition. I go into the room. I sign in. And uh, I didn't memorize the lines. And I, in the back of my head, I knew I wasn't going in there. I'd already signed in. I sat down. I saw a bunch of people there. I'm sure there were like five or six people in front of me. So there was a good chunk of time where I sat there and I, I thought, you know what? What if I just left? What if I just left? So I left. Just wow. walked out. Wow. And I'm sure no one asked me because people go to the bathroom, or whatever. So it's not a big deal. So I just left. And I, I remember going, I remember thinking I got to kill some time. So my mom doesn't know that I just left. <laughs> so there was a bridge in between these two buildings. It was giant midtown buildings. And there was a bridge in between them. And I walked out onto the bridge and I just stood there and I probably thought about like, uh, I don't know, uh, Wolverine and the X-Men or uh, Mark McGuire and Frank Thomas. I thought about nothing for 15 minutes and I killed time. And I was like, all right, I think that's enough. And I go back down to my mom and I meet my mom and I get in and she said, how'd it go? I said, oh, I don't know. I think it went fine, whatever. And I remember her saying, I'm sure you did great. And she said that and I felt terrible. I felt terrible and I immediately regretted it, but there was no going back. So we drove home. We had a hour plus drive back home through the tunnels and the bridges back to Staten Island. And I thought, well, you know, I feel terrible, but it's over. And uh, whatever, whatever, right? So I'll move on. I'll move on with my life. And we get back to the house, and my mom makes dinner, and we sit down for dinner, and the phone rings. I'm waiting for that. Yep. Phone rings. And uh, my mom answers the phone. And, oh, hi. Let me make up the name. Ann. Hi, Ann. What do you mean? Hold on. My mom turns to me. Greg, did you go in the audition? Yeah, Ma, what are you talking about? Yeah, I, I was in the audition. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Yeah, he won in the audition. Really? Oh, okay. hold on. They said you didn't come in. Uh, Ma, I don't know what you, they're talking uh, about. I went in. Uh, I did the audition. I did the lines. <laughs> oh, okay. So now I'm making my mom a liar. And oh. My mom is now lying to my big agent. And the agent is saying, they're saying he didn't come in. And... My mom and, and my agent had a couple of back and forth. And then my mom hangs out the phone and she goes to me, Greg, I don't know what happened, but they, they don't have you on tape. So they said you can go again tomorrow. So now I have to go again tomorrow because I no. can't tell my mom that I didn't go in the audition. No. <laughs> so now I have to actually memorize the f-ing lines and I have to go on this f-ing audition. And I've made a liar out of my mom, and I've now made my agent a liar, I assume, because now my agent's going to tell them that he went on the audition. Yeah, he was in there. So the next day comes around, and uh, I read the script. My mom picks me up from school. She drives me back into the city. It's another hour and 10 minute drive into the city, through the tunnels, through the bridges. And uh, she parks again, and she goes, All right, have. Good luck. Tell them, ask them what happened. Ma, ask them what happened. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, I know. Ma, this is ridiculous. I'm going to ask them what happened. <laughs> so uh, I go back upstairs. I sign in. And at this point, I can't leave. So I'm there. I sign in. And I'm sitting there. And I'm thinking, this is the dumbest thing you've ever done. You're a terrible person. You have uh, uh, let down your mother. You've made your mother a liar. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Oh. <sighs> Uh, so, uh, the casting director or the casting director's assistant comes out, reads the name Gregory. I say, oh yeah, that's me. And I walk in the room, right? So I walk in the room now. So I walk in the room. Hey, how, how's it going? I sit down and the casting director, and it was a big casting director. I don't remember who it was, but she was a big casting director. It was a big movie. She goes, Hey, uh, did you come in here yesterday? I said, yeah, yeah, I was in here. 
oh no and she goes oh i don't i don't remember you coming in i, I said i don't that's weird because I, I came in i read she goes oh okay so do you do you remember me and i said yeah i, I remember you were here and then i looked at the girl behind the camera and i said and she was here too and then the girl behind the camera sticks her head out and she goes i wasn't in here yesterday oh no and i said oh okay well that's I don't know. I don't know. That's weird. And she goes, okay, because we don't remember you coming in. And also, we don't have you on tape. Like, you're not on the tape. And I go, oh, I don't know. Well, it, I mean, it wasn't her fault. She wasn't in here yesterday. <laughs> Which is a... It was a really shitty thing to say, but I fucking said it. Uh, and she goes, oh, okay. All right, well, it's weird. I, I guess we should... I guess we should read it. And I go, okay. And at this point, I know she knows. And I think she knows I know. Oh. And, and I'm a dead man walking, essentially, right? Oh. So it wasn't a terrible read, I'll be honest. It wasn't a terrible read. I, 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 I summoned everything inside of me to not, to not just make this the worst thing ever, even though it was, it was the worst thing ever. And I gave a decent read. And uh, at the end of it, she, and the casting director goes, okay, uh, that was great. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming in. And then as I walk out, I turn back to them. I say, it was great seeing you guys again. And then I leave. <laughs> and then I leave, and I immediately feel like the worst person ever. And uh, I walk back to the car, and my mom, I get back in the car, and, and my mom goes, how'd it go? How'd it go? I, I said, I think I did better today than I did yesterday. <laughs> And my mom said, what happened? How, how come they thought you didn't come in? And I said, I don't know. I, I think there was a new girl today. I think, so, I think the girl yesterday messed up. Oh. And then we drove home. And uh, that's oh what it God. was. So that was 13-year-old me as a child oh. actor uh, trying to process a lot of anxiety and nonsense and just doing the worst thing possible. Oh. And that was it. So what do you think, Gary? I think that, first of all, is the cringiest, most interesting audition story I've ever heard in my entire life. Wow, thank you. Well, it's the first time I've ever told it, so there you go. I mean, I think I have so many audition stories where I've kind of gone in and I've done something offensive or, you know, right. gotten a reaction. I've never, that was so raw. That was so real. If, and it feels, and that's, that's why I said, like, I've never told this before. And every time I think about it, I feel there's a pain in my stomach and I feel terrible every time I think about it. And I hope my mom never sees this because I would feel so bad if my mom ever knew that's what I did. So don't send this to my mom. Gary, well, please. Greg Burke, we have a surprise for you because right now. No way! <laughs> Mom, you there? Work? Come wow. on. Hey, Mom. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm terrible. Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. That was, I, that was amazing. Yeah. Oh, and, that's, and I did it. And I would love to say that in the end, Gary, I got that role. <laughs> no, you didn't. But, Gary, I didn't get that role. <laughs> I'm curious yeah. if that person ever calls you back in. That's a great question. I'm not sure. You know, as a kid, I didn't know. See, that's the thing. Thinking back on it now, like I didn't know the importance of casting directors. Mm. And that casting director was huge. Mm. So who knows what bridges I burned by doing that? You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember who she was. I don't remember her name, but it was a big movie. So I'm sure she was a big casting director. And uh, it was just a really dumb, shitty move as a kid. And... Uh, it's tough because I was a kid, so yeah, it's tough. It's it tough to sort of weigh that against the fact that I also knew what I was doing, but it was a terrible thing to do. Yeah, you know? but you know, I'm not trying to make excuses or whatever. But it is a different world, at, only comparing to what I know, which is my world, where, like we talked about, I had that other job where it was a regular, grinded out job, and. Um, it allowed me to appreciate, I guess, a bit more this idea that I can, oh, get paid to play on camera. Whereas, you know, you were doing that your whole life and it was, it wasn't a fun thing. It probably was a chore after a while. I'm, you tell me, I don't well, know. Well, it's a fun thing. 
I mean, as a kid, you want uh, validation, right? Yeah, sure. You want to be told you're doing good. Yeah. So it was a fun thing when I was getting cast and stuff, and I get I got cast in a lot of stuff. Mm. But it's a hard thing, I think, for a kid to deal with that much rejection mm. that comes with acting. Like, you know, as adults now, we get it. Like, you're going to get rejected all the time. Yeah. But as a kid, it's hard, especially when I was getting close to a lot of stuff. Like, I was getting close to big things. And I remember, my mom would never say this to me, but I remember my parents talking about, like, you know, it, like, if he gets this, that's it's huge. Like, if, I, if he gets Jumanji, that's huge. Hmm. you know and then you don't get jumanji uh, and it's it's hard to process stuff like that you uh, know so that kind of it was like a it was a build-up of a few years building up to this moment where i said i said it. i said i'm just not going in what happens if i just leave wow. you know that's so bold i guess but it was also stupid and dumb and and I, you know, I kept acting. So it's not like I was like, it's not like I put my foot down and changed my life. I went back, <laughs> you know, I kept acting. And actually, here's the weird thing. I wonder, and I'm realizing this now. Soon after that, I got one of my biggest roles. I got a two, star, two episode starring role. <laughs> it's funny to say this. One of my biggest roles was a two episode starring role on New York Undercover. Remember New York Undercover? I remember it, sure. It was a cop show that was big on Fox for like two or three years in the 90s. Yeah. And I got a huge star role soon after that. And I almost wonder if not going in and being called out on it and feeling terrible about it and like, and I remember realizing I can't do this again. Like I can't, if I'm going to act, I got to, I got to act. Mm. So I wonder if maybe that kind of, you know, drove me. It's been, I guess, I don't know, nearly two weeks since we were last on together. Mm -hmm. And we had technical difficulties we had to cut out. But I wanted to finish up because you told, as I said, you told a, a really raw story, unlike anything that I've ever told of my own stories or that I've heard from anybody else. And um, I, I loved it. And um, I wanted to see. Uh, there's so many questions I have. First of all, now that you've told it, do you feel any different? Is there a weight off your shoulders or you're just like, man, nah, whatever? No, I still feel terrible. I feel terrible that I did it. And uh, I guess I feel, uh, I, I guess I feel better that I told it to somebody. Because like I told you before, I had never told that story before. But I still feel awful. It was a mistake. Mm. I shouldn't have done it. I feel bad uh, that I did that to my mom. And I still hope that my mom never sees this. I know. I understand that. Do you think there will ever come a day where you will tell your mom? Um, no. No. Not no. even if you Unless have, like... she finds this video and she's like, <laughs> Gregory, I was surfing the net and I came across Gary Lee Mahmood. You know why mm -hmm. I love Gary. Mm -hmm. And I watched this stuff and I saw you pop up and I didn't like what I heard. I will be That's shocked. What... If That's she my ever mom, randomly finds it. My mom that... likes to point her finger. I didn't like what you said. Mm. Yeah. You don't think there'd ever be a day like if you somehow made it really big where you could be like, okay, listen, mom, I finally made it big. I have an admission to tell you. This is Wow. Could have. you imagine if my Oscar acceptance speech was telling that story and how everybody'd be like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? I would love it. And my it. mom would just be like, what? Why would you do that now? <laughs> Uh, sure. She, if, I, you, if I win an Oscar, I'm going to say this now. Breaking news. If Greg Burke wins an Oscar, his acceptance speech is going to be telling that entire story. <laughs> so, As the, the orchestra tries to play you off. Like, no, 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 no. I got to finish this. I won't let it happen. <sighs> okay. Fair enough. Uh, if you, you know, you're such a strong writer, such a strong director. And you're very good at oh, it. Thank obviously. you so much. You, but it's true. Do you do you still have aspirations to kind of make it whatever that means as an actor? Make it, yeah. I mean, you sort of gave that uh, uh, an add on there. Like, what what is make it right? But I I love to act, so I do still want to act, and uh, I would love to get paid to act. That would be great. But I I do still want to act, and I love acting. Um, so yeah, I would still love to be a full-time actor. Uh, have, you, have you ever thought about what making it would mean to you? 
what would making it mean to me as an actor as an actor it's uh not wondering i guess where your next paycheck is coming from right okay yeah so it's not awards it's not like fame it's just uh feeling comfortable um living as an actor which very few people at very few actors get a chance to do yeah it's very true i don't even know what the numbers are i, I would imagine less than one percent yeah probably yeah all right that's fair enough if you weren't in the biz at all not acting not directing not writing have you ever thought what you might be doing um probably something in sports okay probably some kind of like sports uh sports journalism or sports uh i don't know something i don't know it's hard it's hard to say that that's that's kind of hard for me to to say but that's that was my backup when i went to college i went for media and journalism and i was the sports editor of the nyu news i went to nyu and uh nyu had no we were like division three in some programs and then didn't even have like a football team so it was the sports editor in that even now you're so bored by talking about nyu sports that you took a sip from your coffee I was actually um, just thinking that I went to a school that also did not have a football team, and it sucked. Sports exactly. Sucked so sports. why talk about sports there? No. But I was the sports editor of the NYU News, the newspaper. So my back, my my back, uh, my backup was going to be some kind of sports journalism, sports management. I don't know. I would still love to meld it. We talked about it on set a couple months back. You know, you look like a cop. You get cast as cop all the time, and I want to make the show baseball cop with you. About an old, an old kind of retired cop, maybe on his way out, who catches criminals with a bat and a ball that he just keeps like a sword behind his back. He doesn't hit them with the bat. He tosses up a ball and swings the ball at them, and then the ball hits them, and then he goes and arrests them. So that's, them. A, that's a ridiculous, that's a ridiculous <laughs> story, right? But yeah. I do feel like there's probably, there's probably a, a show at some point that could be made about a retired baseball player becomes a cop. Like a legit show that does sound like something that could be made. Like he, he had an injury early on in his career mm -hmm. and he lived, he's got to be in New York and he probably, he doesn't know what to do with his life. And his dad was a cop. Let's say his dad, his dad was a cop. His dad never approved of him going into sports. <laughs> and, uh, he has a, he has like a big injury. He blows out his knee or something and he becomes a cop in the city, but everyone recognizes him. But they recognize him as the bust, like the the bust, yeah. the number one draft pick for the Yankees, huge mm -hmm. fucking bust. I'm getting arrested by this clown. Yeah, and I'm realizing now I'm cursing, and I'm sorry, Gary. You're gonna have to bleep all that out. Oh, it. I'll bleep it out. No big deal. But we're talking about cops and sports in New York. How can I not curse? Anyway, I I'd love to make that with you sometime. I would anyway. love to do that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's all I got. This really, we waited uh, ten days to finish this off with just that's a few it. That's it. That's all we needed to oh, do. Gary, what did you think about my story? What if you were in my shoes? Would you have done anything different? It's a great question because I've been in those situations, and it happens to me sometimes. Where I'm like, "Why am I doing this audition? I'm not going to get this role." And my usual answer to that is, "Okay." let me either do something really funny in the audition thinking maybe they'll just see me for something else, or let me just go in and completely self-sabotage the audition, self-sabotage the audition to just say, Fuck it, whatever, I'll just go do whatever and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't have to grow up like that. I wasn't like you said in your position when you're nine, 10 years old, where this has been a life for you. And it's really hard to take rejection at that age because it's so intertwined in your own personal value of yourself. And it still is for all of us to some degree, but I think as you get older, you can kind of separate the two. So I've never been in that position. I don't know. I could see myself doing that. Other things that I quit as a kid, I used to be really good at the accordion. I, as crazy as that sounds, I won state accordion competitions. I have trophies, oh like first place trophies. And I only started because I saw some kid playing it in a, uh, like, uh, a school um, talent show or whatever it was back in elementary school. And I'm looking at this kid. I'm like, that looks like the coolest instrument in the world. I'm going to go play that. And everybody's going to think I'm the coolest kid possible. And of course, it's obviously the nerdiest, lamest instrument. But there came a time where it's like my parents, I made a practice. I didn't want to practice. I didn't want to keep doing it. And I just quit. And my parents were devastated over it. I haven't picked it up in years. I think that happens. You won. 
You won the state championship. State state competitions for, in my age, in my age bracket, but yes. For playing the accordion. For playing the accordion. Yes. That's a like terrible pitch in the writer's room for a sitcom. <laughs> What if what if the guy like in his past won the state championship for playing the accordion, and you actually did that? That's I crazy. Did that. Yeah, it was. So it's yeah. it's funny you mention about like self sabotaging because I and I can't remember specifically, but I know I had that thought. Like, what if I just don't? Because I didn't want to memorize a script. What if I just went in there and didn't give a shit and just did it? You know. But I was, I I was more afraid to do that than I was to just walk out. Because I'd never, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't think that they would notice, which is also a different, which is also a different like level to this where I, I, I was so, I felt so uh, overwhelmed by rejection that I thought if I just leave, would they even care? Mm. You know? And I wonder, cause I, I, I'm sure I thought about what if I just went in and just blew it? Mm. And I and I wonder what I was. It's hard to remember what I was more scared of, but I think I just assumed that they they wouldn't even notice if I just didn't go in. And I'm sure there's a psychological level to that that I should probably unpack with a therapist at some point. Possibly, <laughs> or maybe you're just a you're my therapist, Gary. What do you I think? Guess I, I I think I think you're a kid. I think you're a nine or ten year old. I kid was a kid, and kids do stuff not always rationally sometimes mm -hmm. adults do things that are not always rational and i don't know if i'd read too much into it people get burned out especially when you're a kid and this is a high stakes thing you I, you told me in the interview before you your parents would always say hey if he makes it here this is going to be it this could be the big one and i'm sure that puts pressure on you as a kid you know yeah i'm sure it was just like playing the accordion <laughs> just like it my my low stakes new jersey accordion teachers association championship at uh the hilton hotel in hey wherever. back then back i mean we're similar age back then going to carnegie hall was a big thing <laughs> Be, playing the accordion could take you to carnegie hall man yeah sure yeah in, in some ways i do regret it you know i have not picking it up in what 30 35 years now I, I you know i have a similar regret to playing the piano like my mom bought me piano lessons as a kid and i never took them seriously and i really regret it because i love I love the sound of people playing the piano and I love just hearing like the, like just someone playing an acoustic piano. I love the sound of it. And I wish I had kept up with it and taken it seriously. And I didn't. Mm. So when I, I guess what I'm saying is you and I should start a two man band, uh, the piano and the accordion. We play all Billy Joel songs. It'd be great. Actually, I think we could. <laughs> yeah. His seventies and eighties stuff. I think we could get away with yeah. it. We get Lou in on the harmonica. We're good to go. I don't know if Lou could play the harmonica with that beard. Maybe and not. nobody's going to get that joke. People people will get that joke, that reference. People know Billy Joel. At, out of the 12 people no, Lou. Podcast, people don't know Lou. Oh, Lou. Nobody's going to know Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's going to. Well, for those that don't know Lou, look him up. Lou Perez, Greg and Lou. They make a lot uh, of no, great no, no. stuff. This is, my, this is my podcast. Fuck Lou. <laughs> Now, I mean, yeah, that, was there anything else you wanted to add, man? Because that really was it. I just wanted to kind of wrap up that amazing story. Uh, no, I feel I feel uh, I feel terrible for having lived that story. And I feel terrible still for having told it. So uh, I don't know if your goal was to get me to feel terrible, but mission accomplished, Gary. Uh, with that said, where can people find your work if you want to share any of that or social media? Uh, I don't. I have social media. I'm okay. not good at it. I don't uh, post as often as I should. In fact, I don't think I've posted anything on Twitter and Instagram in about a year. But you can find me on Instagram and Twitter uh, at Greg Burke. I don't know, Greg Burke. I think I think Instagram might be Greg Burke HD because I thought that was cool when I came up with a name like 10 years ago. I'm looking this think, up now. Continue. I think Twitter is Greg Burke NYC, which I also think I also thought was cool. Fifteen years ago, when I came up with that, Gary, you can confirm what are what are my Twitter and Instagram handles? Well, I'm looking up your. I don't find you on Instagram. You're somewhere. You don't know, follow me on Instagram. Maybe I don't, but I know you're on Twitter. This is but where we, as a as a community, as a Gary Lee Mahmood community. 
realize that Gary and Greg don't follow each other on Instagram? No, I follow you on Twitter. Okay. At Gregory Burke. That's all it is. At Gregory oh, is that it? Burke. Yep. I have I have Gregory Burke on Twitter. You have at Gregory Burke. Wow. Yep. That's, that's you. wild. And I have Gary Lee NYC. I have the NYC in mind. You see that? Yeah. I think Instagram might be Greg Burke NYC. I have NYC for something. Um, I don't remember what it is, but it's either Greg Burke NYC or Greg Burke HD. If you're watching this, all 27,000 of you. Uh, if you want to find me on Instagram, it's one of those two. Well, if you don't find them on any of the social medias, please go to YouTube and look at Greg and Lou because they have just a plethora of fantastic video stuff that I've watched and rewatched. And I'll probably keep watching again because I love it. So please watch his oh, stuff. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that.